Andrew gave me the title, uh, Treat the Melody with Respect. And I think I know why he asked for that to be considered. Melody surely is one of the great gifts that God has given. The music is one of the great gifts. Melody definitely is... Um, traditional melody. But sometimes we can be damaged by, you know, the sort of... Uh, not that tune. You know, we don't need all those chords. When we're singing the hymns, we do. But when you start to arrange them, you know, don't over-harmonize. <clears throat> um, less is more. It's often said you can harmonize a melody with most melodies with three chords. You should try it. It's, it's quite easy. It really is quite easy. Just any sort of tune you think of and you can play it well. It wouldn't be very exciting most of the time, <laughs> it has to be said. But the basic chords, chord one, chord four, chord five, will just about get you through everything. Five, one. Do that actually, but but this uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I mustn't do it. So I'll do it. Once. One, five, one, uh, four, one, five, one. But if you went four, one, but put it in not with the bass at the bottom, but the the second inversion, so. Okay, isn't it? It's still chord one. So that's one, four, and five will harmonize all the suit. Less is more. Don't over harmonize. Consider the, the pedal. I don't mean this one here, but the, the device of pedal. You know, if you think of those great organ things of bark, and you know, he drops anchor about 10 bars from the end, and you've got this great pedal saying, and all the harmonies changing a little bit. The pedal underneath is, 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 is holding it all together. Um, that's a device you could, you could well use to profit, with profit in your music. Harmonize less. Think about pedal. This is Brahms. Listen to the bass. Yeah, the public 
Polish had didn't return that one <laughs> because he, he just had one note in the bass all the way. Did you hear that? All the way through the whole piece was just that was his pedal note all the way through. Nothing, nothing changed. All the way through. Did you did you think that it sounded boring or as if he ran out of ideas? <laughs> he knew a thing or two about harmony, the drums. So um, you really need to um, think less. Don't go harmonize. Use pedals as well. They really can make. Some of the scores I've seen that we're going to look at today are incorporating some of these features. So I'm really very pleased about that. Um, it would be helpful for us to look at the score for imperfect peace, and uh, we can talk about some of these principles. <coughs> By the way, I must just tell you one thing. When I was a student in the 60s, <coughs> about to leave university, I, um, there was a talk of me doing a one year's, what they call a teacher's education diploma. And I came down to Reading University to have an interview for it. And I had an interview with the head of the department, a Dr. Arnold Bentley, a rather large gentleman. And then uh, <coughs> dressed in black, quite a formidable looking man actually. And um, the interview went very well. Then he asked me to play the national anthem, which I did, just like this. Not all three chords, a few more. <laughs> Conscious of him on my right shoulder. And he was towering over me and he said to me, Don't you ever do that again. And I said, What? And he thought I was trying to be smart because, presumably, when he got to. I found that really offensive. I'm glad you all look shocked. Because <laughs> I was shocked. And I didn't actually tell him what to do with his course, but I didn't go to reading. <laughs> I didn't go. Yeah, he, he just thought I, he was expecting that. I didn't know what he was expecting. I don't know. He was expecting three chords, I suppose, all the way through. So, yeah, I mean, I could have done. But I didn't. I really didn't. And he was, you know, so I didn't go to Reading. So don't over harmonize because you might meet the ghost of Dr. Arnold Bentley. <laughs> I've told you what not to do. Um, as we look at imperfect peace, um, I'm going to suggest things that you could do. Um, I think you should look for the key elements of any tune you're going to develop and try and pick something from that. Uh, if you look at a house in the Cotswolds, which I love, it looks right because it's built from a stone that comes from the Cotswolds. The old ones have got thatch from the countryside. It looks right, it makes sense, something tells you it's right. And I think when you want to develop somebody else's material, which you're invariably using somebody else's material when you take a song, you've got to look, I think, for what are the, what are the significant elements of that and try and develop them. And then, I think, for the listener, it will make sense, it will work, it will be effective. So the, the chorus, has anyone not heard this piece, the perfect piece at all? Because you're quite young with you, and it's been around a long time. <laughs> okay, well the tune, the chorus, goes like this. You will see that um, somewhere, at, at, starting at bar nine. So, these are the elements of that chorus. Let's just call them three, three just for the purpose of this talk. Call that one number one. Number two. The next bit is a is a what do we call that? Same thing in a different pitch. Sequence. Okay, same thing. And the 
start again. That's the best bit. So you've got one and two, and then the last bit of the chorus goes like this. That little figure in the original harmony was that. So those are the three bits for me that stuck out in my mind. And then If you look at the introduction of the score you've got there, it's quite clear that I start with number one. Okay, it starts with one note in the middle of the bands. And there's number three. Okay, do you see that? I mean, it makes sense to, to start the introduction with something very, very identifiable for the listener. But in bar five, you see these in, which I got from the. Does that make sense? Put your hand up, please, if, if anything is obscure or my Scottish accent gets in the way or anything like that. Just say. One other comment about an introduction. An introduction, I think, is probably two things you're trying to do. You're trying to grab the listener's attention. You, you can do that in all sorts of ways. You can go, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, what's that? Right, you did it. You can get the listener's attention in different ways. I do it quietly, but I do it. If you notice, it starts on one note in unison, everybody at the same pitch. This is all sound in the tone higher as I'm leaving off the score. So that, that's one way, but in the course of those five bars, that one note on five instruments, bar five, the whole band is in. So we, that's not a bad device. Get their attention by something. Opening it out so there over five bars you've had a little journey in a way and hopefully the listeners on board so there you are I, idea one and then idea three and as we approach the tune at bar nine um, you might not think this is important but it really is uh, I'll play those two bars before nine That's the first time something slightly unexpected happens possibly, isn't it? That chord just before the tune. So in a way that, that should increase people's attention a bit. And the other thing about bar eight is the clash. And again, I say this to people because when you play things on computers, you might not realize sometimes what clashes are going on. It's so important that you either break them down, play them two lines, play them at the piano, whatever. You need to be responsible for the sound you're creating, right? So in bar eight, you've got this. It's not. Because the first chord is holding that B, the second trombone is holding it as well, and you, so you get this clash. Sometimes when I'm going through music at the piano with somebody and I play something and I look at them and I say, is that what you meant? <laughs> and sometimes I look a bit bewildered. I'm always pleased to say, yes, it's exactly what I meant. <laughs> but, but that little clash there is not much as a tone. Later on it's a semitone. And that is key to this piece. Because if you have a piece about peace, in perfect peace, you also need tension to be resolved into peace, which really happens at the very, very end of the piece. So I really draw attention to that device, that sort of little scrunchy business. 
Okay, when the tune comes, again, we've got that. It, it, notice how static the harmony is at, at, at bar 9. There's nothing really happening. Just have a scene. Less is more. scrunch and then what happens bar 11 is very important so that's idea two isn't it I don't know if you remember idea two at bar 12 as we turn the page is really important and that's the way my mind works and that's I'm not suggesting you work like my mind but but taking the elements from the chorus that you're developing, pick up on those things. So, for bar nine, sorry. Bar 17, 18, 19, approaching bar 20 there. You notice the bass line going down in contrary motion to the melody. Now you've all discovered how effective that is, isn't it? Contrary motion is really strong. So the melody is going up. Um, they're going in opposite directions. That is always a winner. Always a winner. Okay, go on to bar um, what happens at 23. Can anyone tell me where the figure on the cornet comes from, cornet trombone at 23? It's euphonium part. Though. Exactly, thank you. Bar 16. The, the euphonium just plays. And that's from our second idea again, idea 2. So bar 23, uh, yeah, bar 23, we've got good chords underneath. And there's that figure. Sorry. So that came from bar 16, all right, which comes from the second idea. So it goes on. So that's that little transition, a little episode, but it's not really an episode because it's I'm using the, the composer's material. Do you see where that comes from? Do you see, I didn't pick those out of the air. They're, they're in the chorus, they're in the original material. Okay, so we go to the second presentation of the tune, bar 33. By the way, I don't know what you think about bar, the bar, the, the end of uh, the vowel bar, those. Um, I deliberately made that ambiguous. Because where are you going to go after that? But I don't do that, do I? Or do I? It's deliberately, if we go there. And again, I think that's a useful device because, especially in a piece about peace, it, 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 you need tension and resolution. So there is resolved. So that's the second presentation of the tune. Obviously that's uh, something about balance there. Everybody thinks you've always got to hear the tune all the time. But all the ignoramus wouldn't go to the tune by that stage. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. It's not even got it. No, I mean it's um, 
by that stage, a very simple tune like that should be pretty obvious. It is always there. Bar 35, 36, it gets a bit sketchy, 37. Um, but it is always there. Bar 37, you've got the tone warning. But people don't often hear that, really. But it doesn't matter, I think, if the tune gets lost a little bit. As long as the, the, the overall picture makes sense. <clears throat> um, so the, the, in terms of a score, you might be interested in the approach there. That the tune is in the middle, which you've got your bass foundation in the middle of the tune, and the conversation, if you like, the response is in the top part. And then the middle of the mellow is all just moving in. So the close harmony in the middle. Um, an opportunity to exploit the colours of the band, really. People say there's not a lot of colour contrast in a brass band. But colour contrast doesn't just come from the sound, it comes from the harmony, right? So if you write things like... Um, that, that has a certain colour, I think, because of the build of that close harmony. Do you, do you follow that, you think? There is a sound just because of the harmony. Yeah, it is limited in the brass band as to what you can do. But there, I think, you, you can exploit the colours with the, with the corners commenting on the middle band tune. Um, right, where have we got to? Um, bar 40, 41. Um, uh, episode at 47 again it's really that euphonium line again from bar 16 and that change key 
uh, I'll play from bar 50 from 50.
late in this piece, Steve asked me to go and do the bank house at Hendon. And uh, so I took this off, I finished, but I couldn't decide whether, I don't really remember this, Steve, whether to have a tint there or not. And I really wanted that to be sounding, so that's what I was playing. Obviously, it's much less obvious on the tint. But it kind of anchors it all, and, and you appreciate the harmony changing above there. Okay, and then we go over the page into some of these slightly mysterious chords. If I play from bar 70, um, Thank you. 